Five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everyone. We are live, and I invite our moderator, Dr. Raju Ishwaran, to take over the proceedings. Ah, uh, thanks, Dr. Ashok. Uh, very good evening to all of you. Thanks for joining us. We have a very crisp and an exciting session this evening. We previously had our session on the high TPL osteotomy. Today we will deliberate on the distal femoral osteotomy, and just like the last time's format, we have uh, three very good talks on planning and the execution and uh, complex osteotomies, followed by a short panel discussion. I would first like to request and welcome our president, uh, Dr. Ashok Raj Gopal, to uh, set this meeting into motion with his welcome address. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Parag. Uh, good evening, friends. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to. have uh, the second edition of the osteotomy um i think a fair comment is that osteotomy has certainly in the arthroplasty world been relegated to something of a second position and i don't think anything could be further from the truth uh typically osteotomy offers a brilliant alternative and it is certainly a methodology that one needs to be familiar with particularly for joint preservation having said that done well it's a very exciting and a very gratifying surgical procedure and conversely done badly it can be a nightmare i think we have a galaxy of very very experienced speakers who wear their passion on their sleeve and i think we are very fortunate to have uh, these um, very articulate and experienced speakers give their perspectives towards uh, the distal femoral osteotomy so without further ado i'd like to invite the first speaker and uh, as uh, the last time i would encourage as many participants to ask questions and quiz in the course of the panel discussion and in the chat box because it is uh, discussions that make us learn and go forward all the best Uh, thank you very much, sir. Can we have uh, the first speaker's uh, talk on the online, Dr. Clement Joseph from Chennai? He will be speaking on how to properly plan a distal femoral osteotomy. Repetition is always good, and uh, we will hear from Clement on how, how he plans his osteotomies. Warm greetings to everyone, and thanks to Ski for organizing this meet. I'm going to be talking on how to plan for distal femoral osteotomy. Osteotomies in distal femur are carried out primarily to correct a valgus knee in which the deformity almost always occurs in the femur due to lateral condylar hypoplasia, a commoner medial closing wedge osteotomy and also a lateral opening wedge osteotomy is done for the valgus knee correction. Another indication of distal femoral osteotomy is a double level osteotomy in a varus knee where there is a significant varus and a Taking proper X-rays and radiological planning for the wedge calculation are very crucial steps in a successful osteotomy. For a full-length standing X-ray of lower limbs, the patient stands at a distance of around 10 feet with the beam centered on the knees. Multiple cassettes or a long 51-inch cassette can be used to take the long leg standing X-rays. In our hospital, we use a setup consisting of multiple cassettes with a stitching software. And cheaper Indian versions are available for outpatient setups as well. The patient is positioned in such a way that the patella should face forward, and a magnification marker, a metallic sphere of three centimeter radius, is strapped around the lower thigh. A sphere always casts a circular shadow in any position, and hence it is preferred over coins and squares, etc. In a properly done X-ray, both the ASIs should be at the same level, patella facing forward and positioned in the center of the knee. and one should have a non overlapping views of the femoral condyles once we have a properly done x ray the next step is to assess the deformity the weight bearing line connects the center of the femoral head to the center of the ankle joint and it normally passes 2 to 4 mm medial to the midpoint of the joint if it passes more than 15 mm medially or more than 10 mm laterally it is said to be a significant varus or valgus respectively The intersection of the mechanical axis of the femur and the tibia gives amount of varus or valgus deformity. In addition to weight bearing line and mechanical axis, it is important to assess few more indices. One of them is medial proximal tibial angle or MPTA, which is formed between the mechanical axis of the tibia 
and the tibial joint line. The normal value is 87 degree plus or minus 3. It is decreased in tibial varus and increased in tibial valgus and also following excessive correction of HTOs. The next important index is the lateral distal femoral angle which is formed by the mechanical axis of the femur and the femoral joint line on the lateral aspect. Once again, the normal value here is also 87 degree plus or minus 3. It is decreased in valgus due to femoral causes, most notably a hypoplastic lateral femoral condyle. One should remember that coronal plane deformities can occur due to soft tissue laxity which is measured as joint line congruency angle or GLCA between the articular surfaces of femur and tibia. Normal GLCA is around 2 degrees. Anything more than 2 degrees indicates soft tissue laxity. This excess component should not be corrected by bony correction. It should be subtracted before one goes for a bony correction. The aim of the radiological planning is to derive in millimeters the height of the wedge to be removed or opened. In the following slide, we will see how the mini IC technique can be used to assess the radiological planning. The first step is to we have already kept metallic ball strapped to the thigh of the patient and we know the diameter of the ball is 30 millimeter and this ball while being measured on the x-ray comes to around 10 millimeter. Hence the magnification index is 30 divided by 10 that is equal to 3. Any distance measured in the x-ray multiplied by this number corresponds to the real life measurement. In a valgus knee without arthritis, the weight bearing line is shifted to the center of the knee and in cases of a lateral joint osteoarthritis also, a slight varus of 2 to 3 degrees is aimed. Too much varus is not tolerated well in these patients. For a medial closing wedge osteotomy for valgus knee, the hinge point is 1 cm medial to the lateral epicondyle on the lateral aspect. The osteotomy lines are made obliquely at an angle of around 20 degrees so that both the osteotomy lines are equal in length and form an isosceles triangle. This will result in a good cortical contact when the osteotomy is closed and it is very important for stability and to prevent subsidence and inadvertent overcorrection. For a lateral opening which osteotomy, the hinge point is epicondyle and the osteotomy line is around 20 degree to the transcondylar line. The first step is to draw the weight bearing line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the angle. The same line is projected from the center of the angle via the intended correction point of the joint line. The same length of the weight bearing line ends at the point C. The point C which corresponds to the new position of the femoral head after osteotomy is connected to the hinge point and it forms a triangle. The angle at the hinge point is the angle of correction. At this stage, any excess joint line congruency angle GLC which indicates deformity due to a soft tissue component should be subtracted from this angle and then the resulting angle is subtended on the medial cortex along the osteotomy plane. The the base of the triangle is the height of the wedge to be removed. So this is a case example of a valgus knee corrected by a medial osteotomy. And now we come to the role of distal femoral osteotomy in a varus knee in the situation of a double osteotomy. Let's take this case as an example. Uh, on the right side, we can see a severe varus knee in a 34-year-old year old female. And uh, on the software analysis, so we see she needs a correction angle of around 18 degree, which needs a opening which to be made at around 16.4 millimeter, which will result in an MPTA of around 101 degree and a resultant LDFA of around 90 degree. And if the entire correction is made on the tibia, it will result in what is known as joint obliquity, where the tibial joint surface uh, is uh, not perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the tibia, which can result in a lot of shear forces, which can eventually result in early wear and tear of the joint. So this is an example of a overcorrected high tibial osteotomy resulting in joint obliquity. Another example of a 42-year-old male 
uh, whose preoperative planning revealed that if uh, STO alone had been done to correct this deformity, it would have resulted in an MPT of around 97 degree. In young patients, we accept uh, an upper limit of MPT of around 93 degrees. In this case, because the patient is young, we didn't want to have an oblique joint line, a double level osteotomy is performed, resulting in an MPT of around 91 degrees in this patient. To conclude, the success of osteotomy depends on the presence of comorbid conditions, especially petrofemoral osteoarthritis and petrofemoral pain syndrome. And one should also determine whether it is only deformity is being addressed or you are addressing deformity plus osteoarthritis. One should know the location of the deformity and selection of the technique and your familiarity with this technique is very very important whether you are doing opening bridge or closing bridge osteotomy and finally perfect technical execution is also key with this i conclude my talk thanks for your attention uh, thank you so much clement that was a very crisp and a nice talk and i think the key message uh, is uh, gone are the days of guesstimating uh, wedge heights and uh, the use of assistants nodding gleefully at you intraoperatively when you calculate uh, the wedge intraoperatively. It is always good to plan beforehand. One good message that I got from your talk, Clement, is the use of a spherical marker. It seems to be common sense to use a coin or something like that uh, to calculate the magnification. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about this spherical marker? Is it easily available and which software have you used uh, towards the end to calculate the angles, the double level osteotomy? Uh, Clement, are you uh, signed then? Are you able to hear me? Right. So probably the Dr. Clement has some uh, internet issues at his end and he will uh, join in later. So we will keep these questions in the panel discussion and we'll uh, quickly move on. Uh, I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Ragbir from uh, London. He is in the Osteotomy Clinic London and uh, he will be speaking to us on the surgical technique of distal femoral osteotomy. What's new, what's traditional and what are the latest innovations in this field? Hello everybody, my name is Ragbeer Kaka and I'm a consultant trauma specialist knee surgeon and I've been invited um, kindly by the ski committee to talk today about distal femoral osteotomy, how to execute the plan, doing normal MIS and innovative uh, steps in distal femoral osteotomy surgery. I work out of Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital based in central London, it's one of the largest teaching hospitals in the UK and I'm part of the orthopaedic specialist group. I've got a subspecialist interest in knee osteoarthritis and sporting injuries, and have a particular passion for joint preservation. We also enjoy teaching, so we put a lot of our videos on uh, techniques, patient um, procedures, um, all on our YouTube channel on orthopedic specialists. So um, if you want to keep in touch with what we are up to, please do visit our page and it will have our latest videos on there. So let's get straight into executing our plan. As we've heard from our uh, previous talks, it's vitally important to make sure that you perform a planning um, uh, uh, for your uh, osteotomy. As you can see from the experience of my colleague, uh, Christian Clay and uh, Professor Lorbenhofer, a, a lot of uh, various malalignment actually can arise from the femur. It's important that we recognize this. Um, you can see in this situation, this young patient, 45 years of age, who's got various uh, malalignment, actually has got a normal MPTA, but with an abnormal MLDFA. This wasn't recognized by the surgeon at the time, and a tibial osteotomy as his convention was performed. And while it gave the patient a neutral to valgus alignment, in this case, it looks valgus, the MPTA, MPTA was markedly increased. And this results in a, a abnormal joint line and this patient prematurely required a total knee replacement at one and a half years. So this was a 47 year old patient who's undergone a total knee replacement. We've also conventionally done lateral opening wedge osteotomies for valgus alignment. We know that with opening osteotomies, they're very different in the femur compared to the tibia in that the biomechanics are completely different with higher bending forces and uh, the um, iliotibial band to consider when performing such a procedure. And in this particular procedure, bone graft is necessary. And due to the forces going through the hinge, 
failures can be common. Now, medial closing wedge osteotomy is not a new procedure. The, um, as you'll see from the uh, Synthes text, AO textbooks, um, this, is, this has been performed traditionally in the past. But with the traditional blade plates that have been used, there's been a lot of large dissection. And so this obviously affects the vascularity um, around the bone and um, the impaction is part of the procedure. So we've also learned how to do the osteotomy in the correct obliquity. With our large blade plates, we all, you've, we've traditionally been taught to be parallel to the joint. However, we do know that if you do an oblique cut and perform an isosceles triangle to get a uh, closing wedge osteotomy, you get really good cortical support and the stability is significantly greater. So just by doing an oblique cut, um, you get much better um, support. So this is just a cartoon that Christian's put together uh, which I think is fantastic, demonstrating how we do the osteotomy. You can see the isosceles triangle has been taken out. And once the osteotomy is closed, the two parts uh, of the uh, cortex are in contact. And we've passed a hinge wire to um, make sure that we protect the hinge. Traditionally, a distal femoral osteotomy has been done using a uniplanar technique. You can see here no biplane um, has been uh, performed. And the wedge that comes out is a large volume wedge for a closing wedge osteotomy. We know from studies done by Ronald Van Heerwarden and in his team, as well as uh, Alex Staubley, that doing a biplanar technique uh, where you've, your posterior element is approximately three quarters of the femur and you leave the anterior uh, quarter for the biplane is an excellent way of achieving stability and having a larger wedge volume um, for so we take less wedge resection out and there's increased uh, contact surface area. And it's been shown that you have improved bone healing at six weeks. So are there studies to support MEPO plating versus large open approaches? Now this paper also by Ronald and his group in 2012 demonstrated that the vascularity can be significantly affected uh, with the conventional uh, large osteosynthesis um, compared to a MEPO technique. So let's go through the conventional DFO technique. This is a right-sided femur, which is in valgus, and we're going to be performing a medial closing wedge to get a varus, uh, to go varus and take the patient to a neutral alignment. So we do this by having the leg draped in the appropriate fashion. The contralateral limb is um, um, extended out of the way, um, so that you can get access with the II machine without moving the leg around. We perform an incision on the medial aspect of the knee above the uh, medial epicondyle. My starting point tends to be at the same level of the top of the patella, and I make a horizontal incision over the vastus medialis. I then identify the vastus medialis, incise the fascia, and lift the vastus medialis up to expose the medial part of the femur. It's an incredibly straightforward approach. I then sharply dissect the periosteum on the posterior aspect of the femur and using a curved periosteal elevator, I may work my way around the posterior aspect of the femur, making sure I'm sticking to bone throughout the entire um, procedure. Once I've done this, your finger should be able to drop into the pocket behind the femur very easily, providing you've cleared the periosteum properly and your neurovascular structures are now very well protected. I, uh, in, in the past, I've made a box using four wires, um, uh, which are separated to the distance uh, based on my pre-operative planning to do my saw cuts. And you can see in this instance, we're doing a, a seven millimeter cut, and we're aiming to have a five millimeter up to a centimeter um, a cortical um, to uh, the hinge gap uh, so that um, there's enough bone uh, to protect the hinge. The osteotomy biplane typically is approximately uh, typically three to four centimeters long, and it is done uh, 90 to 95 degrees um, to the angle of the um, osteotomy cut. So once you've done the cut, um, you can remove your wires and perform your biplane. Um, be, you know, just always be uh, um, mindful of the fact that the neurovascular structures aren't very far away when you're doing your osteotomy cut, um, but um, providing you put your retractors in the right position, this can be a very safe procedure. 
It requires a competent assistant at the end of the bed applying a longitudinal pressure, but you can also use your own hand to apply a varus force uh, to close the osteotomy gap. At this stage, I keep my saw blade in the osteotomy to, um, uh, to make sure that if there's any debris that's in the way stopping me closing my osteotomy, I can saw this out, almost using the saw blade as a mill to do so. Here you can see we then check the long leg alignment view and typically we're aiming for 45% across the tibial plateau. And here you can barely see the osteotomy which has been closed and then we can apply the plate. Um, just to note that um, the medial plates on the femur for, for, from synthes um, work very, very well um, and they're nicely shaped. You can use this plate or the new clip plate, but on the lateral side, we still tend to use the medial sided plates from synthes because the lateral sided plates are quite bulky. So if we're doing a right sided lateral closing wedge, uh, distal femoral osteotomy, I will use a medial closing wedge osteotomy plate from the left side uh, and that fits very, very well. So just a top tip. So for the proximal locking, you can make a percutaneous incision, pass a candela through the percutaneous incision and apply your proximal locking screws. This is the, one of our patients who's in valgus, uh, who's been planned for a seven mm correction. You can see in the planning here uh, that the deformity uh, for the va uh, valgus is all in the femur. And by doing the medial femoral closing wedge osteotomy, uh, you can correct it to a um, good um, angle. And this is what has been performed. Um, you can see here, these are long leg alignment views post-operatively. So let's talk a bit about the innovations. PSI has been lending itself well to performing this uh, uh, operation. It requires a CT scan um, in the first instance, and a jig is then provided to you uh, with the uh, angles that you require to perform the osteotomy. In, the, in this particular new clip system, you've got a hinge wire, which goes across um, and intersects exactly where the hinge point should be. So that when you do do your saw cuts, you actually can't go beyond the um, hinge wire, so you won't disrupt your hinge. And this is a really useful tool, but it also acts as hinge protection, which um, when we uh, play the video here, you can, you can see that actually the um, hinge wire is protecting the hinge. And if you stress the hinge, it stops the osteotomy um, from um, propagating into a fracture into the um, opposite cortex. This is an opening osteotomy plate. The PSI allows you to um, judge the screws. So the plate comes with um, all the screws that you need to perform the osteotomy and it fits very well onto the side of the femur. We know that the survivorship is really good for femoral osteotomies for, um, uh, up to 10, 10 years for 90% of, uh, up to 90% of patients as um, shown in this publication um, that was in, um, in Kista. The saw blades have also um, uh, improved. You can see here, with this is a precision saw. This isn't readily available to everybody, but if you do have access to this, this has been um, so something that I've changed in my practice and I routinely use. There's less soft tissue damage. It's only the tip of the uh, saw that moves. It produces less heat and it's, um, it's more precise in your procedure. We know that there's, there are femoral, um, there are arterial injuries when performing femoral osteotomies, so please be um, mindful of the hardware that you use. So hinge protection, we've already seen on the, um, the new clip of PSI plate, but we now use um, uh, the um, wires routinely as part of our procedure. This is a femoral osteotomy um, that I was involved with. Uh, we've done through a MEPO technique. You can see we can um, do pass the wires as you require through small incisions. And when you are happy that you've closed your osteotomy, you can um, exchange the hinge wire for a smaller wire where you would like to run your uh, variable, variable pitched um, screw uh, to get compression across the um, osteotomy site. And we always make sure we get an APN lateral. And you can see the wire here on the lateral view going um, straight down the uh, fairway on the, on the femur. And we pass the screw and compress the hinge. This has allowed us to get early weight bearing. A uh, biomechanical study done by um, uh, Mathieu Olivier demonstrates that you can uh, rapidly rehabilitate these patients 
and we get these patients fully weight bearing after surgery um, with, with the hinge nicely protected. With this a case of a patient, actually a GP, who came to see me with um, a quite significant varus, required a, required a double level osteotomy. I've, um, as you can see on this view here, you can see a small hinge fracture here, uh, which I was concerned about. So I put a staple across it, and it was it was very stable, staple, very stable with the staple. And these are nitinol staples, and they provide excellent compression across the hinge. So um, this has really changed my practice also, and I was able to um, uh, get this patient weight bearing. I, I partially weight bared this patient for six weeks and then fully weight bared thereafter. And then they went on to make um, a successful consolidation of the osteotomy sites uh, with a nice correction. You can also do combined surgery for femoral osteotomy surgery. Um, this is a patient um, who's got um, skeletal dysplasias. He's also um, does Taekwondo and he's had a chronic medial collateral ligament injury. Um, so you can see he's got abnormal shaped bones and he was planned for a 7.4 millimeter medial closing wedge osteotomy. And you can see he's very much open on the medial side due to a chronic medial collateral ligament injury. So we took him to theater. Um, because of the shape of the bone, none of the plates were going to, conventional plates were going to fit. So we decided to put a, use a synthes tibial plate, a lateral closing plate for him. Um, these are the steps for the technique. So two wires passed to the predefined gap of seven millimeters. Uh, we have the uh, neurovascular structure pro uh, structures protected. And this is the precision saw performing the top limb of the osteotomy. Then we do the bottom limb of the osteotomy. And we then pass the precision saw in the biplane. Now, I purposely put this image in um, to show that the when you do the biplane osteotomy, you must cross the, um, the hinge point over the top. Otherwise, your osteotomy will not close and you have a greater risk of a hinge fracture. Um, the, the osteotomy was then closed and the plate was applied um, and this correct the, corrected the alignment and we performed a Lars medial collateral ligament um, reconstruction. And as you can see in this case, we had to do an open approach. There was no room to do a minimally invasive approach with the medial collateral ligament reconstruction in the same sitting. And these are the radiographs. Um, it's with a nicely aligned limb and a stable medial collateral ligament. So what are the take home messages from this talk? Do you think of the femur or even in varus malalignment? Consider closing wedge osteotomy where you can in the femur, whether you're doing a, a valgus or varus correction. I would recommend a single um, incision when you're starting out rather than, than doing a two incision technique. We'd use a hinge wire for all cases. It's a simple, relatively benign thing to do that pays massive dividends with regards to protecting your hinge. You can either consider a staple or a screw to compress across the hinge um, for the osteotomy. And combined surgery is complex and do consider a staged approach. And these sorts of procedures are not for the faint hearted. Thank you for listening. Um, just wanted to give credit to my um, colleagues and friends, um, Christian Clay, um, Professor um, Adrian Wilson and Ronald Van Heerwarden. Um, we're, we're the London Osteotomy Centre team. We always welcome people to come and visit us and learn about the procedures that we do. And I really hope you've enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you very much, Raghbir. That was a very nice talk. And I'll set the ball rolling straight away with a couple of questions. One very sure. common concern that most people have when doing this osteotomy is about the approach. It's a different approach than what most orthopedic surgeons are used to, especially trauma surgeons fixing fractures from the lateral side. There are concerns about the, uh, the femoral artery, the popliteal artery. It crosses uh, 10 centimeters above the level of the knee and the hiatus magnus. How commonly does this uh, concern play in real life? And the second biggest uh, uh, concern is the osteotomy not closing properly, which actually makes you look a little full in the theater. So how do you avoid that and how do you deal with that? Yeah, no, thank you for the questions, Raju. I have to say, when I first uh, was show, told about medial uh, approaches, it, I was very um, concerned because it was not a familiar approach. But I have to say, now that I've been doing them, it is by far and away the easiest approach you will ever learn because the minute you're underneath the fascia, you've opened up the vastus medialis and you lift it up, you have the most pristine looking uh, bone right in front of you. 
And the only thing that you must be careful of and very, you know, take your time is to ligate the perforators that provide the vastus medialis. There are, there are, there are two or three that are, very, that are there. And in fact, on the periosteum, you'll find three vessels. We call them the three sisters because they're consistently there. And that is exactly where your point of um, osteotomy should be. So careful ligation um, as you go along. I've never sort of had any issues regarding the neurovascular structures doing the medial approach. So people should feel confident that you can do it without any, any um, major uh, concerns. Now, closing the osteotomy, that, that was the top tip I was giving at the end is that when you've made your osteotomy cut and you've taken your wedge out, there will always be some cortical debris close to the hinge point. So keeping the saw in place um, at the tip of the osteotomy where the hinge is and gradually getting your system to close the hinge point will mean that those cortical debris will come into contact with your saw blade. And you're basically milling those bits of uh, debris out. And eventually the, the thickness of the osteotomy will become the thickness of the saw blade and you will successfully close it. But it's very, it's very important to keep your saw blade in the osteotomy so that you don't change your plane. You've got the exact same plane. You're not creating a secondary osteotomy and you're milling that bit of debris out. So very important. Do you use a tunique routinely or do you do it without the tunique? So um, I used to routinely use a tunique, but in the last, I would say, six months, I do not, I no longer use a tunique. Right. So Dr. J. Maheshwari has a question for you and Dr. Parag also. Dr. Maheshwari is asking what percentage of your varus osteotomies are for um, actual arthritis versus cosmetic reasons? So we don't, I mean, I, I've not done any cosmetic um, corrections purely and simply because it's a medical legal my, nightmare. So they're all, all the people coming to see me are coming for arthritis. Right. Uh, Parag, you want to please? Yeah, so two, two questions. Uh, first question is uh, one of your slides, you showed that, you know, there was a, a fracture of the hinge and you fixed with a staple, uh, was very elegantly done. But my question is, you know, uh, for me, you know, that hardly was a fracture. It was just like a millimeter of opening or even less than that. So number one, why did you use a staple and did that affect your weight bearing protocol? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, you commonly see those uh, cortical breaches and, and because I'm quite keen on rehabbing patients as quickly as possible with weight bearing, I'm, I'm fairly aggressive. Uh, uh, if I see any breach of the cortex that I put something across it, now the nitinol staples, I, I've been using them for the last year and they are very strong. They're, I mean, I've tried to take one out and I, I couldn't, it was just firmly fixed. So for that particular patient, I did modify her weight bearing status. Um, I, I, I partially weight, weight bared her for six weeks because I didn't non-weight bear her, but, um, but I'm feeling more and more confident with the staples now and, and perhaps would get them sort of aggressively, more aggressively weight bearing than with full weight bearing. So had you not fixed her with the staple, you would have gone uh, non-weight bearing? Touch weight, yeah, touch, non or touch weight bearing. I'm, I, yeah, because when you see them collapse, um, then 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 you see, it really makes you feel that you should go non-weight bearing. So yeah, I would yeah. non-weight bear. Yeah, my second quick question is, you know, one of the cases you showed that you do the, did a medial collateral ligament reconstruction. So what's your sequence of, uh, you know, the steps when you're doing an uh, MCL reconstruction along with the distal femoral osteotomy? So we did the femoral osteotomy first, um, and just to, so that we could know exactly where our screws were going to be. And we could, we could miss, you know, the, the medial epicondyle. We'd already marked out our isometry. So it's so a medial approach, work out your isometry. We did two limbs to the medial collateral ligament, the POL and the superficial MCL. Um, then we knew where the plate and the osteotomy cut was going to be. So, so because we knew where our wires were, so we did the osteotomy above that, and we tailor made out made sure that the plate wasn't going to interfere with our medial collateral ligament screw. So, Perfect. work out isometry, do your osteotomy, then do your Lars ligament reconstruction. Thank you. Right. So we have two more questions for you, Rugby. But before that, did you also do the root repair in that case that you showed I a double level? I, no, that I would have been uh, uh, a bit too much, no, isn't it? No, no. And no, I also no, like no. that uh, uh, punchline. Uh, it's almost a bit like uh, it's a bit of a tongue twister, like seashells, seashells on the seashore, a staple for stable osteotomy. That's right. So that's, that's right. a good. I got caught out. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, she was a GP. Right. She actually asked me to do the root repair as well. And I said, look, you know, this is too much. If you're symptomatic afterwards, I will do it. But, you know, you've got to know the limits. Um, and I think, yeah, I didn't want to push it. Right. So we have Mukesh who will ask first and Dr. Maheshwari also wants a follow up. Mukesh, please unmute yourself. Excellent talk, Dr. Ragbir. Uh, in case of dual osteotomies for virus knees, we do good planning as on various apps like Bone Ninja or whatever is available. And you do a closed wedge osteotomy on the femur first, followed by open wedge on the tibia. My question is how much maximum limit can we adjust on the tibia if sometimes we feel we are low on the femur or high on the femur? So your question is, what is my upper limit of uh, correction on the femur and the tibia? Yes. Yeah, so, especially varus knees, arthritic varus knees. Yeah, so look, you know, it's, it's all to do with the final uh, deformity correction. So, uh, you know, I've done a 16 mil lateral closing wedge osteotomy because it was a huge varus deformity on the femur. And, you know, that's a, that's a massive correction. But the the planning, it's all about the planning. It's, I, my only, my single most biggest concern is creating a secondary deformity after, after doing the procedure. So for example, as you ha heard Dr. Clemens present with the MPTA, you know, you want to go up to 90 and, you know, some studies show that you can go up to 94, um, but I don't want to push that. So I want to make sure that my secondary deformity is not created. It's all about the numbers. Abhi, uh, just, re just to rejoin on that, I think his question was, say you're not getting your correction with a 90 and you require a 94 of the MPTA, would you accept a 94 and get yes. away without doing a DFO? Or would yeah. you, do a, you get your MPTA to 90 and then just for a four degree correction, go to a DFO? My, my apologies. Yeah, no, um, Deesha, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's, I would go with 94. Um, you know, a femoral osteotomy is not a benign procedure. A double level osteotomy is not a benign procedure. It's a major thing to do, and I would push it up to 94. So, yeah, I hope, yeah, I hope that's clear. But not 95. <laughs> <laughs> now you're really pushing it. Yeah. <laughs> you would have made a good <laughs> lawyer then, Charles. <laughs> but, you know, that's that's, that's, <laughs> that's real life orthopedics, you know? Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. you think. No, you're right. Where do you cut it off? Where do you cut it off? Are you going to do a DFO for four degrees, five degrees, six yeah. degrees? Yeah. What's your cutoff? I think that's so interesting because you're going to yeah. add a DFO, but then there's, you know, how much can you really take your MPTA beyond 90? I think that's the whole question. Yes. So, so the, uh, the other thing to bear in mind is, is that with a DFO, the smallest correction you can do is probably five mils anyway. So, so there are two, those are the two main reasons why you would then go to a double level. If you're going to do anything that's around the 95 mark, go, go and do a femoral osteotomy. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Last question. And yeah, first, uh, so yeah. first, just a comment on the previous question uh, about 94, 95. Uh, I thought there is a law called Wolf law. Uh, have you totally given it up? It doesn't really matter. Or do you think when you overcorrect instead of femur into tibia and go over, say, 94-95, over a period of time, would wolf law work or it doesn't work? So that's just my comment. I've often thought about it. Why do double osteotomy take double the trouble, double the complication? Anyway, so I come to my question now. And very interesting that... Uh, um, like in my practice, I do almost 20 DFOs in a year and 19 of 20 is cosmetic deformity. Hardly ever. One out of 20 in a year is a valgus osteoarthritis in a 40-45 where I do a corrective osteotomy. Of course, when it crosses 55, I do knee replacement or whatever. I've not done a unicondyla. But amazingly, so I want to ask uh, Dr. Kaka, where do these uh, young ladies with genu valgum, very cosmetically not acceptable. Where do they go in London? Which osteotomy clinic do they go to, if not yours? <laughs> there are there are there are plenty of people who who are willing to do cosmetic procedures, and 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 in London you can go along Harley Street, and I'm sure they'll find find the right people. Um, but how come how come they don't come to you because they're cosmetically aware, and they want osteotomy done? Why not osteotomy yeah. clinic? Where do they go? Yeah, well, I think I think it's what you develop a reputation for, right? So as long as you have a sort of you're very humble about your practice and you are very strict with the guidelines of what you're planning on doing, I think you know people know your reputations for doing osteoarthritic and young adult osteoarthritis. 
Um, just to comment on your initial comment, you know, it's not to do with um, the bone remodeling, Wolf's Law, I totally respect that. It's to do with the joint line obliquity. You saw in my first example with that young patient, if you completely offset and go massive on the MPTA, the shear forces going across the articular cartilage are, are, are unreal. And that's not based on uh, anecdote, that's defined in the evidence. So. So I would I would say you know it's not we don't do it for vanity or surgical you know showing off essentially it is done to make sure that we maintain within three degrees of um, the joint line obliquity uh, horizontal to the to the par parallel to the ground. But I'm sure Dean Shaw's got a good good answer so the, to that as well. So the question question I asked was with a particular intention because many of these cosmetically conscious females for corrective osteotomy they don't want a scar they don't want the implant inside. What do people do there in London to make the cosmetic correction? But very little scarring, very little implant business. So they don't want, one thing they don't want is a big scar on their leg, at least in India. And you know the background of how Indians think and all, how female, when they have a scar on the leg, what does it mean to them? It means a lot to them. I'm sure. Did you have something to add? Uh, my question was, Dr. Maheshwari, regarding Wolf's Law, did you mean that if you bring the MPTA to 95 form follows function and in time it's going to get back to 90 are you suggesting that because i think that's impossible so I, I i feel there must be some level maybe not 95 maybe 92 93 94 you know when when then the balance between the wolf law accepting wolf law versus doing another osteotomy that balance has to be achieved i'm not saying go 97 98 and do only one be crazy about it no but there is, to some extent, a wolf law which works over a period of time and they straighten out. We see this in osteoarthritic knees, how they deform, how the rotational deformity comes in, how various deformity comes in over a period of time when a patient is walking like that. So I feel when you have a consideration of another surgery, which is also a major surgery, then all these things come to my mind, whether it is scientific, do they work in long term, 10 years follow up, I don't know. That's why I I'd be interested to get Clement's view on this as well, because Clement in his last case showed a double level osteotomy. So Clement, what's your MPTA threshold for uh, osteotomizing the femur? And I also had a previous question based on your talk. And where do you get these spherical markers? Are they very easily available? That was a very good practical tip you shared. You're not audible, Clement, unfortunately. Oh, I think that's a problem with his uh, audio. Yeah. So we'll just pass at the moment. Correct. So Clement, maybe you can answer in the chat box and uh, maybe if you can sort it uh, by the time we get to the panel, that will be lovely. So, okay. I'd, uh, so just a clarification. So when you say Wolf's Law, that means the structure depends upon function. Is that right? So your bones will adapt based on the stress or the demands placed on them. So, you know, how will that correct Dr. Maheshwari sir, the you know, hoping to correct by nature or by that. So I, I think that I agree with each other. That will not correct, but probably your body will adapt angle, which is incorrect and the joint line will remain a little oblique. Absolutely. So I think that will happen. The body is going to adapt, but with that, you're going to get joint line obliquity, which itself is going to have long-term consequences to that knee. So there's always that, you know, where do you cut it off exactly from Dr. Maheshwadi's, you know, thing that how do you, where do you decide what is enough is enough. And as uh, Ragbi said, DFO is a big procedure. You can't do a correction less than six degrees. So then probably sometimes your MPTA, and I agree, I would probably go up to 94, but not push it beyond that. I guess the personality of the patient also matters and comes into play. I mean, most people will be frightened at both ends with the prospect of a double level osteotomy. So I think the patient personality and activity level also comes into play. Clement, I think you've figured out your audio. Would you like to answer your question? Yeah. Yes, Raju, I'm sorry about that. Uh, see, the younger the patient, I don't like to go beyond 92. Okay. How are, young are, is young for you? Audible, Raju? Yeah, yeah you're audible, much. but how young Eight, is young for you? I have taken a leap. Uh, less less than... Okay. 40, 45 and all, if you're doing osteotomy, probably we'll stick to somewhere around 92. But if you're doing, uh, for example, in a middle-aged lady with a root repair, probably we'll go up to 95. So that's uh, one thing, which because they have a uh, less um, number of years, in, I mean, after which you can convert to an osteotomy. But the younger the patient, we try to uh, maintain as uh, perpendicular joint line as possible. And coming to this uh, spheres, uh, I think they are available uh, in Amazon. 
and we buy the spears and stitch them in a velcro strap long velcro strap and these are strapped to the lower part of the thigh and uh, the ball lies in the same plane as uh, the lower distal femur so the chance of uh, par parallax error everything is much less uh, this is not my technique uh, my colleague dr kumar used to work with dr mangal pai he picked up from him so we are just using that uh, i think uh, that answers the questions of you that's wonderful clement maybe you can uh, uh, resell the stitched uh, uh, belt back to amazon and name it as a clement <laughs> belt or something <laughs> That's a brilliant yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. So it's now just... we move on to the last talk of this session. And uh, if you thought that uh, distal femoral osteotomy was a relatively simple affair, I think Dr. Bhushan Sabnis from Mumbai is about to spin your head a bit with rotational corrections. Uh, I think they are primarily for patellofemoral problems. Dr. Bhushan, we'd love to hear your views on derotational osteotomies of the distal femur. Okay. Can you see my screen, guys? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, after such a brilliant uh, session of uh, DFO, let's uh, make things a little bit more spicy. We talked about medial side osteotomy. Let's talk about the lateral side now. So, uh, this is one of my uh, sort of favorite surgeries nowadays. It's a derotation distal femoral osteotomy for patella instability. So, I'm going to go through a couple of cases and chat as we go along with about the theory as well. So, uh, my take on things is uh, very simple. So I feel patellar instability is uh, a multifactorial uh, issue and era of lateral release and medial placation is very long gone. MPFL cannot be relied upon to hold the patella in position. So MPFL is just check in ligament, it will stop the subluxation, but it will not move the patella up and down like a steering wheel. So you need uh, to realize that we need to get the tracking normalized before we put the MPFL in. We need to find why it's dislocating and treat that factor. And the treatment will need to be individualized as you will see uh, in a couple of cases I'm going to uh, show. Uh, one of the things that I learned from uh, one of my ex bosses in Southampton was get the tracks under the train. That means you don't try and move the patella to come under, come on top of the trochlea, but you move the trochlea to come under the patella. And that is the most successful approach uh, of uh, managing patellofemoral instability. Of course, this is my take. So it's uh, something which I've been following and uh, uh, touch would have had good results so far. So an ideal patient for someone who requires a, a derotation distal femoral osteotomy should be skeletally mature. I won't do it in a kid. Uh, it should there should be recurrent dislocation and extension and up to mid flexion, sometimes even deep flexion. Uh, femoral intorsion should be more than 20 degrees and they classically present with an intoing gait. And you should have appropriate uh, hip range movement, as you would see on a Staheli's rotational profile. We'll talk about that. Uh, uh, DFO, derotation DFO in isolation is generally not sufficient. You need to add a lot of other variants. So you can varize the femur if there is a uh, uh, there is a valgus deformity in the knee. You can do a tibial tubercle transfer. You can do distalization for patella alta. There is a specific subset where you need to do proximalization. I'll show you a case for that. You always need to add an MPFL reconstruction. Mm -hmm. Quite a few times when you're doing a, a massive lateral release, you need to do a vastus lateralis lengthening also. And you sometimes add a trochleoplasty along with the whole thing if you uh, still have some energy left at the end of it. So this is what we talked about uh, when we assess pediatric patient. This is a Staheli's rotational profile, and this is someone I'm operating this week, uh, sorry, coming week. Uh, so as you can see, there is obviously excessive internal rotation of the femur on one side as compared to the other side. And this is usually seen by a corresponding, uh, corresponding increase in, uh, corresponding rate decrease in external rotation. These children usually, or these patients usually sit with a, Taylor's position, and like a reverse cross-legged position, they are, you find it difficult to sit in a cross-legged position. So now this patient, as you can see under anesthesia, there is massive amount of internal rotation as compared to external rotation. So you assess this preoperatively to decide what surgery is going to be required. You can also assess the foot progression angle when they're walking. They walk with their foot inside. So that's a typical squinty patella, as we call it. That means the patella are facing towards each other. So they have uh, internal rotation deformity in the whole of the lower limb, and they do feel really uh, amazed once everything is corrected because they're able to walk normally. Sometimes if you get to them very late, there's already compensatory TBL rotation and you might have to add another rotational uh, osteotomy in the tibia. Uh, 
uh, fortunately that's not very common in Indian patients as such. So your mainstay of investigation relies on a CT rotational profile apart from your normal patellar height and trochlear uh, anatomy measurement that you do on your MRI scan. So this is how your normal uh, this is how your normal uh, CT rotation profile looks. You measure the angle between the distal femur compared to the femoral neck, and you assess the internal rotation of the femur. Normally, there should be about neutral of five to ten degrees of external rotation in the femur uh, if the antiversion is normal. But in quite a few patients, the femoral neck antiversion is excessive, and that uh, is translated into distal part of the femur by excessive femoral internal rotation. And this is the cause of the problem. And when you look at a CT rotational profile, you'll find that the patella is already sitting uh, on uh, almost subluxed, even in normal uh, resting position as well. So let's go through a couple of cases as, as we talk. So this is a 23-year-old girl. Uh, she has a recurrent dislocation of patella on one side, uh, has had uh, about 16 episodes till now. Uh, style is, is completely positive. There is uh, dislocation till about 60 degrees of flexion. That means there is uh, some rotational as, uh, problem as well associated with. So her problems at present are patella alta. There is excessive femoral intorsion. There is massive lateral tightness and lateral uh, tilt in the patella. So that's her CT rotational profile, as you can see. And you can see there's excessive femoral internal rotation and the patella is sitting already on top of uh, the lateral femoral condyle rate or subluxate even, at a, even with a minor insert as such. That's her arthroscopy. And as uh, you can see, there is uh, the trochlea doesn't look that bad, but look at the position of the patella. The patella is sitting way too lateral with massive lateral tightness and massive lateral overhang. So this is sort of a typical uh, patient that you would advise uh, uh, distal femoral osteotomy for. So that's my normal lateral approach. Uh, olden times, about four years back, I used to uh, do lateral uh, DFOs, splitting the ITB and always struggled with the ITB. Uh, I visited Fengua in Beijing uh, about three years back, uh, uh, God rest his soul. But uh, uh, well, he, he said, why don't, why don't you do it my way? And he just showed me a couple of cases where he went anterior to the ITB. And since then, it has been a really easy surgery to go anterior to the ITB as such. So I'm sorry about this. Let me just go back a step. So that's the same patient on table now. Doesn't look that bad now, I agree. But the patella easily subluxates out. And there is significant instability in the patella even with normal insects. And what I would do is uh, I use paper wages to decide the amount of derotation I'm planning. Normally, it's about 20 to 25 degrees and sometimes 15 degrees based on the rotational, rotational profile of the patient. So that wedge is cut by 50% of the width of the distal femur at the level of osteotomy. And I'm passing two wires, which are uh, on the sides of the wedge. And my aim is to get these two wires parallel at the end. So these two wires are being passed at the level of osteotomy. This will be a transverse osteotomy. So the central wire that you see is the level of my osteotomy. You need to place your plate and confirm that you have sufficient fixation, the distal fragment, and you are perfectly parallel to the joint line. Otherwise, you can uh, induce a lot of parallax and cause problems in your fixation as such. So that's another patient's x-ray, but you can see, you can see there are two wires which are passed uh, uh, along the correct intended correction on the wedge. And there's one more wire, which is passed parallel to the uh, distal, parallel to the proximal wire. So these two wires are parallel and your aim is to, so this wire is being passed parallel to the uh, posterior wire and your aim is to rotate the distal fragment in such a way that this wire will come parallel with this wire once you're done osteotomy here. So that's the whole gist of your osteotomy. I believe, uh, as Rack said, uh, I believe in doing biplanar osteotomy. It works brilliantly, but obviously at a biplanar osteotomy, you are slightly at a loss about rotation because biplanar osteotomy is designed to give stability to the osteotomy. But there's a, there's a very clever way of doing it. So that's your normal osteotomy which is going parallel to the joint. And that's a double bioplanar osteotomy that we are planning to do for this patient. So that's your dual bioplanar osteotomy where we are going to take that small wedge off, which will allow you rotation of your distal femur. 
Sorry about the noise. Okay. Yeah, that is a wedge coming out. That's the biplane wedge which has come out. And it's important to be pretty thorough in taking the wedge off completely. Once you have done that, you've got sufficient space to rotate the oscillator. And that's how your derotation essentially works. So you can now get uh, the femur, distal femur derotated. That means the distal fragment can be rotated externally and you can get the alignment back to uh, normal rotationally so that uh, you are sorted about uh, the rotational problem of the patient. Now, this in essence is the whole of the operation. Quite a few times you need to add something more as you can see here. So uh, quite a few times, despite doing a good derotation ostromy, you will still find that uh, the patla uh, still needs some more help. Uh, this is the same patient that we discussed before. So she has uh, a significant patella alta that I need to correct as well. So I'm doing a standard uh, T-belt tubercle osteotomy. Now, I've seen surgeons doing it through a small incision where they just move the distal tibial uh, tubercle uh, medially. I think it's important to move the whole of the extensor apparatus to medial side. So you need to access this part and move the whole thing uh, medially and uh, proximally or distally based on what you need. So if you are seeing in this patient, I have medialized it by seven millimeters and distalized it by about one centimeter. And the moment you have done that, the patella becomes superbly stable with excellent stability to the patella as such. And the last thing is to be added is your MPFL reconstruction. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's your uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy fixed with appropriate translation and distalization. And your patella tracking is quite good. And once you have done your MPFL reconstruction, you can see the nice looking MPFL, which is extra synovial on the medial side of the uh, patella. You can uh, almost see the patella is on nearly central now. So you can see the patella is sitting bang on in the middle now. So you have corrected the deformity where it was, and that usually gives an excellent result to most uh, uh, patients if you have planned it properly. So that's our x-ray about uh, uh, two weeks post-op just before the staples were removed. And that's our x-ray six weeks from the surgery where everything seems to be healing fine. These are young patients, so they tend to heal really well without any issues as such. And that's her. Uh, I don't know why the video has done this. But that's her about uh, three months from surgery where she's gone back to her normal life. She has, a, uh, in her words, an ugly looking scar, but she's quite okay because her knees become completely stable now. So this is, uh, in a sense, is the whole procedure as such. Not every time you need to distalize the femur, uh, distalize the, the tibial tubercle. There, is, there are a subset of patients who have habitual dislocation of patella. And these patients have a typical patella baha because the uh, uh, the patella has been sitting out for so long. Uh, she's one of such patients. Uh, you can see the CT rotational profile. There is significant interrotation of the femur. And uh, that's the Staheli's rotational profile. If I can show something there. So you can see the excessive femoral rotation in her and a corresponding reduction in yeah. sorry, significant yeah. rotation in her and corresponding reduction in extrotation of the femur, which is very classical for these patients. Now, a, a standard midline approach has been used for her, and this is one of the biggest lateral leads I've ever done. So as you can see here, I'm going anterior to the iliotibial band, and I've opened the joint laterally, releasing everything on the outside. I've released the vastus lateralis, and I'm going to lengthen it at the end. I've taken the uh, sorry semi T for a MPFL reconstruction. I have uh, done a tibial tubercle osteotomy as well. That's generally how the surgery is performed. You can get a CR min and see everything nicely. So that's your derotation osteotomy once again. You can see the rotation uh, being corrected. That's the wedge being pulled out on the top and. Ready? That's a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So same standard technique has been followed for every patient. So once again, that's the wedge that being take that that is being removed and the correction being achieved by 
uh, external rotating the distal fragment and you can achieve a nice looking uh, uh, patellar tracking. Now in this patient, I have proximalized the, uh, uh, the, the TVL tubercle by one centimeter and medialized by six millimeters to correct uh, the deformity as such. And indeed you can on the X-ray see uh, a defect in the distal part of the TVL tubercle. Now, this is a very rewarding surgery and she's the patient who has So, I'm telling her not to do it and she said, I can do this. Am I allowed to do this or not? I can't take the video or the audio off or something. That's a general function you can actually in most patients. And you rarely see a MRI of corrected rotation. So, if you can see the internal rotation of the femur, which is corrected this. So see, she, for some reason, had an MRI done postoperatively, and that shows a perfect neutral position of uh, the distal femur after the osteotomy as such. So this is a very successful surgery as such. Sometimes life throws real uh, stinkers at you. Now, this was referred by a colleague of mine. This girl is uh, a physiotherapist, 21 on the last year of uh, uh, physiotherapy uh, uh, degree course. Uh, she's a below knee amputee and has recurrent patellar dislocation, has about 20 episodes of dislocation. And uh, fortunately, I've had some dealings with amputees. So I know you don't touch the stump as far as possible because uh, it changes the dynamics significantly. Her issue is her knee is uh, bending nicely. She's got good range of motion, good strength, but the patella is not at all happy to be sitting there. Now that's her rotational profile. As you can see, the patella is sitting on the uh, edge of the lateral femoral condyle and it's going to fall down anytime it needs to. Uh, and that's her rotational profile. As you can see it, uh, the patella is sitting way out and the patella is sitting way out and it's going to fall down anytime. That's a weird looking X-ray, I agree, but uh, that's because of there is uh, some uh, sinusosis between the tibia and fibula from the congenital anomaly she had. So same principle, same approach, released everything on the lateral side. Uh, lateral side approach is quite good because there's nothing stopping you, but the neurovascular structures are exactly here. So you need to take your time to clear the area properly, to release everything down all the way to the medial side, then pass your wires in the standard position as you would do. Things were uh, looking slightly tricky here because of the very short stump she had. So there's no control on the distal fragment as such. And uh, once you have uh, uh, done your, your correction planning, you would then, then things start falling into place where you know how much rotation you have to achieve. So these two wires have to come parallel at the end when you finish the surgery. So again, there's an array of wires as you can see. That's your standard uh, transverse osteotomy, which is parallel to the joint line being performed on the wire, followed by that wedge that I, I've talked about. So that wedge is being removed now. And same again, derotation being done. The derotation is a bit tricky when you have no control on the distal fragment as such. So it does seem odd. The, the fixation is not that good in the with the distal K wire but you can easily rotate the distal femur the way you want without any issues. And that's her after completing the you know, uh, with, uh, mm. you can see the patella tracking decently and that's at the end of the procedure where you have done your MPFL reconstruction as well. And as you can see now, the patella is not going to come out anywhere. The range of motion is still preserved and I haven't touched the stump, so I'm sure that she's going to heal well. So that's her post-op X-ray, and that's her about uh, six months from the surgery now. Now, when she lowers the trouser down, I think it's very difficult to find out which knee has been operated because she's gone back to her normal life as a physio. She's able to climb stairs uh, down normally without any issues as such. Sometimes you have to do more than this. Sometimes you have to varize the femur as well. So remember that. Uh, that uh, proximal biplane piece that we took off, you, it can be used as a spacer to correct the uh, the valgus deformity and you can place it in the uh, osteotomy on one side to get a correction as you can see here. So you can indeed varize this easily just by putting uh, uh, the same bone piece 
now from the trans from the vertical part to the transverse part of the osteotomy and easily get the correction that you desire. So from uh, Mikulis' point of about 75%, she has come to 50%. And uh, again, you have uh, killed two birds with one stone. You have done the DFO, derotated, as well as corrected the valgus in one go as such. So this is how generally I uh, do a distal femoral osteotomy with derotation. And I hope that makes sense. Now, remember that first patient I showed who had a, a very significant uh, rotational problem in the femur. Now, that's her uh, post-op uh, on table view. So you can see the patella is tracking quite well. And you got good range of motion without the patella moving anywhere. And uh, I think I'm doing her second side in, uh, in 10 to 15 days now. So I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Sorry, it's an amazing talk, talk Bhushan. Amazing. This, as I showed before, and the post up as I showed. Sorry, go ahead. Wonderful, Bhushan. I mean, this is an amazing and an incredibly complex surgery. And uh, I opened this to discussion, and I finally understood what Einstein's theory of relativity means. The ACL on my list tomorrow relatively seems very straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so very nice talk, Pushan. Let me start the questions. Uh, I have my first question that, you know, what is your exact pre-op planning? You did mention it, but uh, what is that particular uh, data which you look for to decide whether you need a distal femoral osteotomy versus just doing a table tubercle osteotomy, just doing that shift and an MPFL? So when do you decide that just a TTO and an MPFL is enough? versus adding a DFO with this rotation? So my general uh, uh, take is that any uh, femur with a distal, uh, distal internal rotation of more than 20 degrees is abnormal. Uh, so any femur where the, uh, any CT rotation profile which shows a distal femur angle of more than 20 degrees internally, I think needs to be corrected there. Now there has been a lot of discussion about correcting near the hip joint versus correcting near the, uh, near the, uh, 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 knee joint. I think the problem we are dealing with is knee, so it's better to correct it near the knee joint, so I, I prefer DFO. So, uh, anyone with significant internal rotation and an appropriate stahelis rotational profile, so someone who is not able to sit cross-legged because of the excessive femoral neck antiversion or distal femoral intorsion, whichever way you look at it, will be an ideal candidate. Most of these patients are in their uh, teens and early 20s, so normal age group is between 15 and 30. Uh, the oldest I've done is about 41, where I think I was stretching it too far because the body's adaptation of a derotation is difficult as you go old, in my opinion. So a CT scan is a must for your pre planning. Okay. So, so without a CT scan, you wouldn't know. Every patient I see after clinical assessment has uh, for patella femoral issues gets a CT rotation profile. And I've been surprised time and again that uh, someone has a compensated uh, distal femoral intorsion, uh, which was not uh, easily accessible on clinical assessment. So I think that's an important learning for me, at least I can speak, because I don't do a CT scan regularly in all my patients where I have a patellofemoral femoral problem. So I think from today onwards, I think that's mandatory because I might be missing something. Uh, Ragbir, is there a PSI for less complex knee surgeons to make the surgery a little easier? There is. Um, just firstly, Raju, congratulations to Bushan. I mean, that's an amazingly complicated osteotomy to do, particularly with the biplane. Um, there are jigs to try and help you do it without doing the biplane osteotomy. So a single uniplanar derotational osteotomy, there's PSI jigs available for that. Um, but but not, not doing that sort of complex wedge biplane osteotomy. I've not, I've not come across it. Uh, great cases, Bushan. Raju, do you mind if I ask a quick question? Please do, please do. And then we'll have Zinchar's yeah. comment as well. So, so with regards to the patello uh, femoral instability, Bush, and what percentage of your patients do you find or need an MPFL with that once you've done the derotation? Do you do that routinely for every patient or sometimes you find that you've corrected the bony work, you don't need to do the MPFL? Yeah, so I, I do it for every patient. I, what I've realized the hard way is that after doing such a complex surgery, if you're still uh, having a slight minor mal tracking, I, I'm eating my words just now based on whatever I said. I think an MPFL will help in stopping that uh, patella from subluxing, even if they stretch it too much or if they have, have a fall or something like that. And I think once again, MPFL is a normal ligament. So just putting a normal ligament back in gives them a good tracking or stops it from subluxation. So I do MPFL for every patient of, uh, uh, even if it's just a TVL tubercle transfer also, it has to be TVL tubercle transfer plus MPFL. 
Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Dinshaw, you may please go ahead. Uh, Bush, an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, these plates, which are laterally based, uh, do they cause any irritation to the IT band? Uh, what, what do you require to remove them subsequently? Because we know that when we compare medial DFOs with lateral DFOs, the medial ones, the plates are well covered with soft tissue and therefore don't cause any hardware irritation. But the lateral plates typically have been known to cause a lot of uh, IT uh, band irritation. So do you require to remove them routinely? Uh, what, uh, what's your take on that? So exactly as Rag said, as Ragbir said, uh, I use the opposite sided medial plate for lateral osteotomy. So these plates have less number of screws distally. The normal uh, lateral plates that are there from Synthes or any company has about six to eight screws in the distal part as compared to these plates, which only have four screws. And it doesn't, these plates don't need to go all the way to the joint line. So they can be placed uh, uh, quite proximally without causing any irritation. So the irritation mainly happens very close to the joint line, in my opinion. So if you put these plates, uh, generally, I haven't I haven't removed anyone's implants yet, except for one patient where it was a completely different reason. But uh, religious reason, they don't want any metal work inside, something like that. But generally speaking, these plates I haven't removed. And Bhushan, I remember you mentioning that you go anterior to the IT band as per uh, your training. And that with Dr. was Singh. a big revelation to me. So uh, previously in our teaching or in our uh, uh, in our uh, dissections and in our uh, access to lateral femur, we cut the ITB uh, midway through. And then you always struggle to release, uh, to find the space anteriorly or posteriorly. If you go anterior to the ITB, there's so much of space. And if you bend the knee, the ITB just falls back. It becomes a flexor. There is so much of space. So slightly differing from uh, what uh, Rack should, I do all my osteotomies in flexion, like a TKR. So it becomes very easy when you flex the knee. The ITB is not at all a problem for your dissection or for your approach as such. Mukesh, you wanted to have a question? Yeah. Excellent talk, Dr. Bhushan. In one of your case, it was looking as if it was a cliff type of trochlear dysplasia. So how you differentiate between that and uh, in how many percentage of your cases do you have dysplasia along with uh, internal rotation or something? So I think all of these will have some form of dysplasia along with a distal femoral rotation. I think with trochleoplasty, you can easily correct five to seven to 10 degrees, even 10 degrees of rotational deformity by uh, creating a groove more laterally. But uh, for someone more than 20 degrees of external rotation, I think you will need to treat the problem at the root and not treat the effect, which is a trochlear dysplasia. So uh, if, if I feel there is a bump or a cliff type of trochlea, uh, it was actually the case, but I, I did not do it because she already had a lot of things going on with amputation. So I didn't want to do a trochleoplasty. Uh, I had told her if I'm not happy with the tracking at the end of everything, I'll do a trochleoplasty for lateral approach itself. But uh, I haven't needed to do it. I feel uh, DFO, derotation DFO is a very powerful surgery and you can get a really good uh, realignment going with that. And that helps significantly in improving the tracking for patients. But I agree with your point. For a trochlear bump or someone with a cliff trochlea, you can add a trochleoplasty along with that. But the trochleoplasty has a limit of how much rotation you can change. That's my Thanks. I'd uh, like to cut short the discussion on uh, this particular case uh, with your permission because uh, we have the panel discussion to follow and some of the points may be discussed subsequently. So the panel discussion will be led by uh, Dinshaw and uh, Ragbir and uh, I'll request Ragbir to first present his case. I think he has to leave yeah, a just list. Just two quick comments uh, from uh, I think uh, Clement and Maheshwari, sir. Just very quickly, you know, if you had a point. So I have just one point. And that is to all the speakers, when we use a plate which is ending at the, you know, diaphyseal metaphyseal junction in an adult, is it customary to remove those plates because they're stress point or we can just leave them alone and nothing happens? Then shall just cover that point and uh... yeah, Bhushan, any quick answers? No, I think uh, unless the plates are ir irritating, you don't need to remove them. I think in femur, uh, a plate, uh, I won't remove all plates, uh, generally speaking. We are talking of a young set of population here. They have yeah. good bones. We are not talking of a 50-year-old person where uh, 
uh, there is osteoporosis going on. So I would leave the plates inside. But yes, if someone has osteoporosis and if I see signs of stress riser effect happening, I would be more than keen to remove the plate to avoid yeah. any further prosthetic fractures. Clement, last quick question and then we move to the case. Uh, it's an amputee case. She had a type C trochlear uh, bushion. Could you have gotten away with a resistant trochleoplasty because even though you do a rotational osteotomy, you're removing the wedge, the effect it is producing on the petala is uh, something similar to the Gutelier resistant uh, uh, trochleoplasty. So instead of doing a plate and everything, could you have just removed a wedge from behind the bump and pushed the trochlear back? Would it have given the same result than going for an extensive osteotomy in this patient because she's an amputee? I, I did consider that. Uh, I, I must agree with you. But uh, I just thought 20 degrees of derotation would be a much better uh, derotation for someone like her because I didn't want her to have any more surgeries in life apart from what uh, I'm doing to her. So uh, touch wood, it worked well. But I agree with your point. Trochleoplasty is a very powerful surgery when done properly. Maybe I should uh, uh, try it out a bit more and learn a bit more about it. Thank you so much, everyone. We now move on to the panel discussion. Uh, I'll request uh, Dr. Ragbi to first set up the uh, case, the first case, and then Dinsha will present his cases. The panelists are the three speakers and Dr. Maheshwari and Dr. Sachin Tapasvi, if he has joined uh, by now. I think he's set to join a little later. Yeah, great, thank you, uh, Raju. So my mind's, I mean, very straightforward case as compared to what we've just seen with uh, Bushan. So my case example, is a gentleman that I operated on together with uh, Ronald um, a couple of years ago now, actually, but just an interesting case. So this uh, gentleman, he's 46 years of age. He's got a background history of uh, Charcot Marie Tooth with hind foot deformity and a significant valgus deformity with lateral knee pain and instability that he was very symptomatic from his um, recovatum. And you can see on the lateral long legs, which we're able, able to get, and the excessive recovatum that he does get. And we can also use these to measure our, our, our slope. So he's just, a, he's just an interesting case that I wanted to present of, 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 de, of a combined uh, deformity, um, but both recovatum and, and valgus and, and how, we, um, how we dealt with that. Um, shall, I give the, shall I give it away, Raju, or do you want, do you want people to discuss what they would do? Okay, I'll, I'll explain our surgical uh, tack then. So, so this gentleman's got, as I said, two deformities. So we went ahead and firstly did our distal femoral osteotomy to correct his uh, valgus uh, alignment. You can see the standard technique which we use with two wires up to the hinge point. He's previously had an ACL reconstruction also. Uh, we've passed our uh, saw done a closing wedge osteotomy on the medial side and applied this plate. Uh, there were no hinge issues with this uh, particular patient. So this was really interesting, and this is a, a lovely technique that I've been taught by uh, Ronald Van Heerwarden. So the first approach is to take the tibial tubercle off. So you take, remove the tuberosity and you reflect it anteriorly. So you now have access to the front of the tibia without the tibial tubercle in the way. So the extensive mechanism is, is to one side. Well, you then pass a wire from the front uh, to back, and uh, this is where your osteotomy is going to be to correct the slope. The wire ends up at the PCL footprint in that sort of rough area so that you've got enough of a hinge uh, that, that stops a fracture propagating into the joint as well as put in the posterior cortex. We then pass a, we pass a second parallel wire and we then pass a saw underneath these wires and gradually open it up with osteotomes. In that opening, we then put a femoral head allograft, which is shaped as a triangular wedge so that you can increase, increase the slope and stop the excessive recovatum. In this case, we've reflected the tibial tubercle back down again and fixed it back in. And we've used the tibial tubercle as a plate. So we describe this as a biological plate um, to, to fix um, a part of the osteotomy back with small fragment screws. And to supplement our fixation, we've used these um, staples uh, which are readily available. So in one case, we've been able to do a combined slope changing osteotomy and a femoral um, osteotomy. And you can see um, he's gone on to have the a similar procedure on the on the left side, but this was what it was like post-op. So that was my case. 
Ranveer, may I ask you a question? Yes. I'll start up the discussion. So normally with ACLs, we don't like to increase the posterior tibial slope. We like to decrease the posterior tibial slope. Yeah. So now that you've increased the posterior tibial slope, he's already undergone an ACL. Is there a chance that that ACL is going to be put through more in vitro forces? Uh, and would that predispose the ACL to failure, though you've got him now uh, without his recovatum? And second yeah. to that would be, if that's the case, could you have corrected it just with the femoral osteotomy, uh, the recovatum, uh, and not touch the tibia? That's a really good question. And that's something we put to the patient. You know, it's a real dichotomy as to whether you, you uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. And, you know, so you've got to decide what's more important to the patient. Um, so the risk of developing an ACL rupture is, is definitely increased. So he basically had stopped playing competitive sports. He was a keen skier in the past and a, and a footballer. And he, he, he said, look, you know, at the moment, the thing that's bothering me the most is the reek of Artem. But you're completely right. By increasing his slope, you will predispose him to ACL rupture. Now, I've not um, dealt with doing uh, reek of Artem surgery through the, through the femur. We do, uh, and I think through that, that uh, I'm sure that's technically possible. But I think throughout the range of movement, flexion and extension, doing it in the tibia is technically not a very difficult thing to do. So yeah, you could consider it in the femur, but it's not something I'm very familiar with. Thank you. Any more questions from anyone? Raju? No, I think if there are no more questions, we can probably move on to your cases, then, Chong. Uh, great case, Rugby. So I'm going to now uh, take two cases. And uh, Dinshab, by the time your screen sets up, Clement has raised his hand. Clement, uh, yes, can you pitch it? Clement. I want to ask Rag Rugby, uh, uh, nice case. Is there an upper limit of uh, slope correction that you can do by this technique? Um, so the, the greatest we've, uh, we've done is about 15, 15 degrees. Um, I think, uh, you know, th there's no sort of... The, the only thing you've got to be mindful of is the patella height, which is why we do the tibial tubercle osteotomy, so that we can adjust our uh, patella height if we've massively increased or massively decreased the slope. So on the lateral radiograph, when you're taking these x-rays at 30 degrees of flexion, you've got to be very careful that your patella is engaging at the height that you wanted to, rather than developing a secondary Baja or Alta, depending on which way you go. So from a technical perspective, no providing you are mindful of your patella height post-surgery, at the end of surgery. Okay, great. So I'll get on to my cases. Uh, since we don't have much time, I'm going to go a little fast. Okay, so we've got a... So I had this 32-year-old male recreational tennis player and uh, he presented to me with a left knee ACL tear, left knee ACL tear in 2012. And uh, that was an unstable knee. I went ahead and did his ACL reconstruction. He's a case of multiple osteochondromatosis. And at that point of time, I noticed that his right knee had a significant genuvalgum. And uh, I asked him, you know, isn't this uh, troubling you in your tennis? You know, you've got a limb length discrepancy. You've got a genuvalgum. He said, no, I've got absolutely no symptoms at all. I've got no problems and therefore I'm not going to touch it. And he had uh, no real cosmetic concerns. And uh, so was happy to leave it at that. He then presented to me in 2014. And by this time, he was starting to get right knee lateral pain. So he was playing tennis all these years. He's now started getting pain in the lateral aspect of his knee. It's mild, just comes uh, as soon as he completes his first set, then he starts getting pain. He had no tender exostosis, uh, although he had exostosis above and below. None of the exostosis were tender. Clinically, his knee was normal, including his patellofemoral joint and striking. And we could see some early changes of an osteophyte developing there. So we got an MRI done. But the MRI itself was normal, no lateral meniscus tear, and clinically he had no torsional abnormality. So we went ahead and got his uh, scanograms done, and that's his uh, scanogram there. 
And when we assess this in detail, he's got a significant genovalgum. So when we assess it with the anatomical axis of the femur and the tibia, it's about 20 degrees. His MLDFA is 80, his MPTA is 98. His joint uh, convergence angle is two degrees. And he's got a true limb length discrepancy of 31 millimeters. So the right limb, true limb length discrepancy, 31 millimeters. And that's what his uh, knee looked like. So what are your thoughts on uh, how you would assess this knee and how you'd go ahead uh, treating it? So uh, uh, Raju, what about you? Okay, if Raju is not there, let's get uh, uh, rugby. are you there? And would you like to give a few pointers as to how you'd go ahead in assessing this knee? Okay, uh, Bhushan, since you've taken your mic off, you can uh, you can just give us a few pointers. Very straightforward, you know, case. Uh, and always rely on you to give complex, most complex cases to us now. <laughs> okay. Um, so there is deformity both in femur and tibia. So I would think of a double level osteotomy to correct uh, the deformity as such. Uh, there is a discrepancy of 31 millimeters. So his... Uh, uh, you said his pelvis was stable. His pelvis was even. It was his pelvis is stable. He's got no spine issues. He's just got a true limb length discrepancy. And this uh, side is longer by three centimeters. By three centimeters, exactly. We will have to do a closing wedge osteotomy both on femur and tibia, uh, which actually is a good thing for healing for him. So I would think of a medial closing wedge uh, osteotomy for uh, tibia as well as uh, on the femur to correct the deformity and uh, do the femur first, get him to about uh, uh, 88 of LDFA and then go for about six to seven millimeters correction with TBR to go for about uh, uh, 88, 89 for MPTA. That's how I would think about it. Okay, great. Um, Dr. Maheshwari? Yeah, so I think I'm, I'm a little more, more conservative. Uh, of course, deformity is on both sides, but I would correct it majorly in TBR. And because I know the ends of these bones in osteochondromatosis, the bone quality is not as good. And I know whatever I may do, my implant holding and things like that are going to be a little doubtful. So I will chicken out and just do correction in the tibia, maybe over correct it a little bit to compensate and not do two level osteotomy. Okay. Um, my question to you also, since you do believe, I mean, you do get a lot of patients for cosmetic corrections. When he came to you earlier, in say, uh, you know, when the ACL was done in 2012, he had no symptoms. Would that be an indication for deformity correction at that point when he had no, when he had no symptoms as such, but we could probably predict that he's gonna land up with problems with this kind of a deformity. Would you? Not, not at all. Cosmetic correction is always patient's demand. And most of these young adolescent girls in the age group of 18 to 25 have only deformity, no symptoms. They just don't like their legs like that. This guy was not interested. I wouldn't touch him till he gets symptoms. Okay. Clement, what about you? What do you think are the indications for deformity correction in these severe genuvalgum knees? Can we predict that these patients are going to land up with problems? And is there a role for a prophylactic deformity correction, knowing that you're probably going to have to do it someday? Why not do it before you land up with any problems? Yeah, yeah, definitely I would uh, discuss this option with him uh, because he's a very athletic, uh, active person, he's a tennis player. Eventually he's going to land in this problem and also ACL reconstruction gives an opportunity to do this uh, procedure at once. Probably at the time I would not have gone for a double level osteotomy. Probably we've done a minimal uh, closing with osteotomy with the ACL on the tibial side. It's still on the opposite side. Yeah. Maybe you would have advised a femoral cor cor correction later. Probably that little correction, even though it's not perfect, might have postponed this eventuality. Uh, definitely, I would have discussed this option with him, uh, but it's up to the patient. Yeah. Clement, the ACL was on the left knee. He had an ACL on the left oh, no, knee. No, not on the, not on the right knee. Uh, not on the no, right no, no, knee. No, no, no. It's, it's very, very ACL difficult. ACL reconstruction, but I noticed that his right knee okay. had a severe deformity. In fact, when he walked in, I thought he's okay, coming okay. in for his right knee, not his left. And then he said, no, no, my right knee is perfectly okay. all right. You know, there's no problem I would, there. I would have given our 
<laughs> okay, we probably have given our brochure for osteotomy. <laughs> That's all. We have okay. discussed in a general terms. Probably okay. I don't have told him. And, and you agree with Bhushan, yeah. close wedge osteotomy versus opening wedge. You're going to do a closed wedge uh, for sure? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, great. So, uh, but the osteo... Yes, sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. But the, de the deformity apex appears to be slightly lower in the tibia. That's one point. Uh, is the apex of the deformity is slightly below the metaphysis in the tibia. Would, that, would it change uh, the plan then, sir, in this case? Uh, if you notice, the proximal tibiofemoral joint is fused. Oh, yes. So if you're going to be doing anything distal you know, if you're going to do a, not a high tibial osteotomy, but a low tibial osteotomy, you're probably then going to have to do something for the uh, proximal tibiofemoral joint too. Uh, so my next question, uh, is Sachin there? Sachin is not there. Okay. Uh, Bhushan, what about the common peroneal nerve? Would that be of any concern to you when you're doing a correction, say, of 20 degrees, uh, what are your indications for doing a release for the nerve? And uh, you know, do you do this routinely with the severe corrections, or uh, you don't? And in this particular case, with uh, you know these osteochondromas, especially there, would you like to do that prophylactically? So, if I'm doing more than ten to fifty, more sorry, more than fifteen millimeters of correction on the tibia, then I would prophylactically decompress the nerve. Is uh, is there a big osteochondroma right at the fibular neck or fibular head there? Well, if you see that, you know, definitely there's fusion there. Wrong, though, yeah. So you know that there's something going to be wrong there. He's got no peroneal nerve symptoms at all. Huh. So for me, uh, I, I did go ahead with the common peroneal nerve release also at the same time. So I'm going to show you what I did. So normally I like to use a table like this. This is the Jackson's table. So uh, this is really used by our spine guys. But what this gives me is good access for that C arm. And I can slide the C-arm really well. This is meant for the O-arm. And if you require, you can use the O-arm too. If you're going to do a rotational correction and you're not too sure, you could use an O-arm to try and get that assessment of rotation also. So I always use this kind of a table for my osteotomies. I did the tibia first because I thought that the major, uh, like Dr. Maheshwari mentioned, the major deformity was at the tibia. But I went just as uh, just above the uh, tibiofibular joints so that I could get away without doing anything to the joint itself. You can see that gospies, the first thing I've done is uh, done a common peroneal nerve release, I released that so that I don't have a problem. And I was really happy that I did because there was this big osteo, uh, this uh, big exostosis at the uh, uh, head neck junction of the fibula. And uh, you know, if I'd just done a correction, that might have been a little dangerous. So I got the tibia corrected uh, to 91st. Then I went to the femur, did a double level osteotomy. And uh, so that's what it looks like at the end of the uh, correction. So he's got a nice uh, correction there, uh, back to his uh, neutral position. And you can see that because I did closing wedge on both sides, I could get his length also back to normalize. So 868 on this side and uh, 862 on this side. So uh, you know, just about a six millimeter difference. And um, I thought the closing wedge was better primarily because you could uh, 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 achieve his, uh, correct his limb length uh, discrepancy too. Yes, Bhushan. So why are you so proximal in your uh, DFO? Is there any specific reason for that? Uh, because of the, um, uh, you know, so I've done it on the medial side and uh, I thought that this part of the bone, probably I could have gone a little lower, but I'm a, very afraid of these plates being as the more, the plates are under soft tissue, I feel that then they don't create problems. As soon as you come more and more distal, in the normal bones, I think that's not too much of a problem. But uh, with these knees, uh, you don't know where the neurovascular bundle is, how well you're going to be able to clear it. So I just wanted to be in a slightly safer area and do an oblique osteotomy there. I agree, I could have been uh, a little distal too. So did you dissect the neurovascular bundle out of the way when you're fixing no, the proximal Absolutely. Screen? So... Uh, uh, you make sure that you've gone through and through right across. So you've got a circumferential uh, clearance and uh, uh, make sure that your uh, vasculature is completely out of the way, of course, in these situations. And one last question, biplanar or uniplanar? This one was uniplanar. So this was done 
in, uh, if I remember correctly, 2014. At that point of time, uh, I was doing all of these as uh, uniplanar and not doing these biplanar. In about 2018, I started doing these as the uh, biplanar, the DFOs. Excellent. Okay, so that, yeah, so that's the pre-op and the uh, post-op. And I'll go to the second case. Now, this patient had bilateral patella instability. So in 2011, this patient came to me with bilateral patella instability, 15 year old uh, male, and you can see the left side, the genu algum is not too bad. And uh, in fact, he had more symptoms on the left side when he uh, initially came to me. That was the one that had almost a habitual with recurrent dislocations and more painful. And on the left side, which didn't have too much of a deformity, at that age of 15 years, I did uh, 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 tibial tubular osteotomy, osteotomy tubule, uh, tubical osteotomy with a MPFL reconstruction. And we got that uh, patella back in position and that went off well, he had no problems. And then two years later, at the age of 17, he came to me uh, in 2013 with right patella instability. So that's the right side now, which has a uh, genu valgum. And he's got this patella instability there. That's his MRI. No significant uh, 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 trochlear dysplasia, though the patella certainly looks dysplastic and flat. And uh, MRI-wise, his ligaments okay, his lateral compartment okay, his lateral meniscus okay. His TTTG was 10 millimeters, so not significant. Now, unlike the cases that Bhushan showed, this patient didn't have an intorsion gait. He had an extorsion gait, and he had a femoral version of five degrees. So the question now to you is, how should I be treating this patient with genu valgum and patellar instability? His left side is asymptomatic now. He's already undergone a, a, a tibial tubercle osteotomy with MPFL. Surprisingly, with growth over two years, you can see that he's probably increased his genu valgum on the left side as compared to two years before. But he's asymptomatic, got no problems there. Now, with this knee, which has significant genu valgum, how would you treat this patient? Dr. Maheshwari. So I think there is a bony component uh, by way of genu valgum, which is contributing to petline stability. Yes. So I would I would correct that and also look at uh, Petla Alta carefully, and if that may though TTTG you said was only ten uh, this thing, but uh, if, if it is Alta, sometimes they're displaced and one can't really measure. No Petla Alta, even. as you can see, there's no real Petla Alta. Yeah. So most yeah. So uh, Genu welcome correction with MPFL. With an MPFL, okay. Uh, Clement, I know what Bhushan's going to say, so uh, I'll come to Clement. Clement, your mic, please. Even the uh, trochlea looks a bit flatter and almost looks like a type D trochlea, even though it is not very prominent. I would um, uh, look for uh, instability beyond 30 degree. Uh, if he has a mid flexion instability, probably I will uh, do an MPFL reconstruction and probably a tro trocleoplasty and uh, do lateral uh, retinacular lengthening. So that would be my uh, plan. But if the valgus is uh, more, uh, I don't know, uh, do you, how, how was your uh, measurement of valgus? Any angles you can give, Disha, in this case? 15 degrees. 15 degrees of semorotibial anatomic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. E even though he has a valgus, I'm sure that uh, he may remain symptomatic if you do this uh, MPFL trochleoplasty and uh, lateral uh, lengthening. So okay. definitely I will consider uh, uh, valgus correction osteotomy, but I would still uh, be happy to offer this solution to him. Okay. Yeah. Parag, Parag, what is your cutoff for uh, indication for DFO in patellar instability? How much valgus would you accept in a patellar in case of patellar instability and say, look, I'm not going to do a femoral uh, osteotomy. Uh, so what's the sort of cutoff that you would use, uh, Parag? Yeah. 
Okay, uh, Bhushan, let's come to you. What would be your cutoff for so, Valgus? When would you not do and when would you do? Yeah. So anything above 65%. So when the Mikulis point is beyond 65%, I will start thinking of uh, bony correction for a recurrent instability of patella. I think it's uh, any bony correction is far more powerful as compared to soft tissue corrections. And if I if I achieve a, a bony correction, then my soft tissue reconstruction will not be under pressure. And I can expect a long-term uh, successful result as such. So any anything above 65%, I would think of a correction. Unless uh, it's the same on both sides and uh, the other side is not unstable at all. Okay. Now, this patient had an extortion gait. Hmm. Uh, how would you how would you how would you do your osteotomy? Would this be different from what you just described? So uh, if it's an extortion gait, of course, derotation doesn't come into picture because that will uh, make things worse straight away. Uh, my uh, so my uh, thinking about uh, such a kind of patient will be to correct the valgus by medial closing wedge osteotomy or a lateral opening wedge osteotomy, depending on your preference. And I would do a massive lateral release and maybe a lengthening of the vastus lateralis by uh, Z-plasty by uh, a good couple of centimeters or even three centimeters as such. And I'll add an MPFL reconstruction at the end to see if uh, everything falls into place. I would leave trochleoplasty as an option if uh, before putting MPFL, if I'm uh, I'm still not happy with the patellar tracking. Okay. Now I said this uh, trochlea. Trochlea uh, was quite okay. okay. So what did I do? I did uh, a corrective osteotomy and uh, I did do it on the medial side. So medial closing wedge. Okay. But unlike a derotation, I rotated it a bit. You can see that about 15 degrees. So it's five degrees. I brought it to a 20 degree, uh, you know, rotation. So you can see there's a little bit of a rotation I've done there. And uh, that rotation was primarily to make sure that his uh, extortion is now back. So you can see on the other side where the extortion has not been corrected, where I've done just the uh, 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 MPFL with the, uh, the tibial tubical osteotomy. And you can see here his limb position is in a much... Uh, better position. So that of course was the osteotomy healing. And I had this uh, almost six or seven year follow up of him just a few days back and he's become much healthier. And when you look at the two feet, you can see that because I've done an osteotomy here is his foot position is in a much better sort of position. His extortion has now come into a uh, neutral sort of 15 degrees. He's got no patella instability on both sides. Uh, he did undergo an MPFL at the same time. So, uh, you know, in the last uh, six, seven years post-surgery, he's got no instability on either side. But if you see his limb, his limb alignment here on the left is better than the right. It's asymptomatic uh, on the right is better than the left. His left is asymptomatic, but he certainly has this extortion and therefore both sides are not uh, symmetric. So uh, it was an interesting case because... I used a different technique for the two different knees and uh, still had patellar stability. You, uh, you got your, uh, you gained your outcome of patellar stability, which he's come to you for. But I think that adding the osteotomy on the right really gave him a better biomechanics. And uh, because he's asymptomatic now on the left side, I'm not considering anything further. Uh, Dinsha, I have a question. Sorry, I, I had net issues. I couldn't join earlier. Uh, you mentioned what angle is the threshold for correction uh, for a valgus uh, deformity. Uh, does it bother you that uh, for a patient with patellar instability, once you have corrected for valgus deformity, he then has to face this problem of asymmetry, which nature doesn't tolerate that well? One side is in uh, neutral alignment and the other side, as can be seen, is in, uh, uh, is in the previous valgus alignment. Correct. Right. So I think what's the cutoff? In literature, the cutoff seems to be 10 degrees. So up to a 10 degrees of valgus in patellofemoral instability is something that uh, people would accept. And anything beyond 10, so like this knee on the right, which was 15, I did not accept. And um, if you look at it primarily, when he first came, and of course he was only at that time 15 years, there's a difference in the two knees. But you yeah. can see already by the time he's 17, and therefore, at that point of time, I did not consider an osteotomy here. 
But when he came to me at 17, I can see that that's already probably in you know, a 12 or 13. And he's got an asymptomatic knee. The question is, would you consider an osteotomy at that stage? Uh, Dr. Maheshwari, would you consider an osteotomy at that stage? Uh, on, the, on, the, on which side? On the left side? On the left side, which is now asymptomatic. But to get him equality, because no, exactly I, as Dr. Well, Dr. well again, again, it'll be more of a cosmetic correction unless the patient wants it. Yeah. When true. it is a cosmetic thing, patient has to demand it. True. And which, of course, he is not keen on because he's not keen on cosmesis and functionally he's got Absolutely. no problem at all. You see a lot of patients who are roaming around on the road where their limbs are differently and they would not like them to be touched at all. Dr. Maheshwari, you have a question? Yeah. So my, my question is, you know, a lot of like, it's a little different, not DFO related, but a lot of these patellar dislocations have bony dysplasia by way of valgus, by way of, you know, patella alta and also trochlear dysplasia. Now, I have a tendency to not do all the three corrections. If all three are there, I chicken out and avoid doing uh, the trochleoplasty at least and just manage with more predictable and in my hand, uh, valgus correction, antibiotic velocity. Uh, how aggressive are my colleagues on doing everything? If you have three dysplasia, correct all three. Okay, so I'll take that first. I think, you know, this is patellar instability is a, uh, is a complex issue. And to be yeah. quite honest, a lot of the patients who come to me are adolescent females. For them, cosmesis is one of the major considerations. Some of them would rather live with patellar instability then have these large scars on their knee. And so uh, I, I suspect that many of the patients I offer a large scar to, uh, something like, uh, in, in fact, I wanted to ask Bhushan that question when I put my hand up, is that a lot of these are females and how acceptable are they you know, to these uh, uh, larger scars when you're doing these uh, procedures? So for me, I try and keep it as simple as possible. If I don't have to do a bony procedure, I'm gonna do an MPFL reconstruction. If I've got an increased TTTG and my MPFL is not is going to have a high rate of failure, I'm going to add a, a you know tibial tubercle osteotomy. If there's a significant trochleoplasty, then I'm going to do a trochleoplasty, a, a trochlear dysplasia. I'm going to do a trochleoplasty with MPFL, but I don't try and mix up too much and try and complicate the issue because I think then it becomes more and more uh, complex. Try and keep it simple because then for me those are predictable results. Yeah, I think I, I agree with what you're saying, Dinsha. We need to keep it simple, but uh, you need to also individualize treat, uh, treatment for every patient. So when you have a significant rotational component, a significant patla alta or baha, a significant trochlear dysplasia, they will need to be addressed. If you're expecting one part of the body to compensate for dysplasia or deformity in the other part of the body, there's going to be a limit to it. And in 10, 15 years time, that's going to fail. And we all know operating on a virgin knee versus operating on a knee which has been operated 10 times. So a lot of these patients have had uh, medial plication, lateral release done before, Campbell's procedures done before, uh, even MPFL done weirdly before. And then it becomes quite difficult to address this. So what I feel our approach should be is to do one thing that will last them for a lifetime rather than uh, doing something and say, we'll see after 10 years, if you need to add something, we'll add something. That is only valid for someone who's skeletally immature. If I get a 12 year old who still has a growth spurt left with a recurrent dislocation, I will do a slightly non anatomic MPFL reconstruction and tell them they will need a, another surgery, let's say five years down the line. And they're generally okay. About the scars, I think you need to educate the patient. So, one of those patients who aspired to be a model actually in my series, I told her to go and see a plastic surgeon to get the scar covered. And she was pretty okay about it. So, you tell them there will be a scar. You might need a plastic surgery if you are if you're worried about your scars. That's not uh, something which I would deal with just now. But the priority is what's on the inside, not on the outside just now. So these are the words I normally use. And most of the sensible ones accept. Uh, some of them don't. And I don't know where they go. But uh, I think we need to treat it at the root and not just treat the effect of uh, the dysplasia, which is a simple MPFL. Uh, Bhushan, just to add to your uh, comment uh, on the 
young patient, a skeletally immature patient with a patellar instability, uh, you'd do a soft tissue procedure now and then consider a osteotomy later. A lot of our pediatric colleagues do this figure of eight plating, a very simple plate across the growth plate, and that really works very well. Uh, have you ever had an experience of some uh, an operation like this in conjunction with your pediatric colleague and then a patellar instability? So I, I have done the epifacial disease plate myself a, a good few number of times, and that works really well. But you need to have a good close follow-up of the patient because those plates will, will need to be removed when the growth spurt arrives to avoid opposite deformity as such. So I think that's a good option for someone who has one or two growth spurts left. So normally uh, around 11 or 12, if they come with a genuine valgum, you can do epifasciolysis. But it has to be done on both the sides. Otherwise, you get limited discrepancy. So there will be a lot of counseling required for the patients that uh, we are going to correct the deformity now on the valgus side. And if there's any overgrowth, we might have to stop the other side also. And they need to come every, every six weeks to get x-rays or three months to get x-rays or uh, uh, scanograms or whatever is required. So you need a very close follow-up of those patients. Nowadays, I've started referring these patients to pediatric orthopedic surgeons rather than myself. But they are very simple, easy surgeries, just a... Uh, eight shape plate, one screw proximally, one through distally to the facial plate. And that stops the growth for quite, uh, quite some time without any issues as such. Uh, there are deformity correction surgeons delight. I mean, the simplest deformity correction you can ever hope to do. Absolutely. Raju, so I think, you know, in a child who has open physis and has a genu valgum with patella instability, I think it's much better at that stage itself to do an epiphysodesis. A small, simple procedure, get your deformity correction done there predictably instead of, you know, then considering an osteotomy uh, later on, which is a much bigger procedure. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so this completes our cases and uh, over to you, Raju. For the conclusion. Thanks, thanks, Dinsha. And I think it's been a very good discussion of some extremely complex stuff. And I'd like to thank all of you uh, from my behalf and uh, behalf of Dr. Parag and uh, Dr. Raj Gopal. It's been brilliant discussions, a lot of complex cases presented. And based on your feedback and thanks to your suggestion, Dinsha, we will probably look at having a session on uh, peripatellar osteotomies, trochleoplasties and tibial tubercle osteotomies, even though they have been touched uh, extensively by uh, Bhushan in his talk and uh, through the discussions. So based on the feedback that we get from this session, uh, I'd like to thank everyone for participating actively. Uh, have a great uh, week ahead. Bye-bye. And uh, we, will we will be announcing uh, the other course very soon. Thanks, Dr. Ashok, uh, as usual, for uh, an excellent broadcast. And uh, uh, have a great evening. Bye, everyone. Bye.